Hello. Hey, everyone. Super excited to have you all here. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our session today is going to cover AI infrastructure on GCP. Let's go ahead and quickly do a round of intros. I'm Manish Sanani, uh, Director of Product Management for AI and ML infrastructure at Google. And I have my colleague here, Adam. Go ahead. I'm Adam Karen on product marketing for AI infrastructure. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everyone. Super excited for all of you to be here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about AI infrastructure and why should all of you choose Google Cloud for your AI infrastructure needs. So first and foremost, it, Google Cloud offers accelerators for every use case. So ranging from TPUs to GPUs to uh, low cost inference as well as high performance training. So across the board, we have an accelerator, we have AI infrastructure that is offered to all our customers depending on their range of use cases. Secondly, we have price and performance. So from a price and performance standpoint, you are as a customer able to iterate really fast using our high performance GPUs as well as our cloud TPU products. And last but not the least, I want to quickly talk about how easy it is for all of you to get started and get going on your AI infrastructure needs. And we have a combination of tools offered through GCE, which is the Google Compute Engine, as well as the AI platform or cloud AI platform that you heard about from Andrew Moore earlier today that lets you leverage all of these infrastructure purposes very easily. You heard earlier from Andrew, uh, Andrew Moore at the keynote today about contact center AI, around document AI. All those solutions and products behind the scenes use AI infrastructure, which is powered by Google Cloud. And it, depending on the underlying needs of the workloads, those customers use GPUs or TPUs. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, handing, off to Andrew, handing off to Adam to take this forward. Thank you, sir. So before we dive in on the how and why to use this infrastructure, I'm going to give you a brief history of time of both silicon and software to give you more of a sense of why accelerators are so required in the world of AI and why, in turn, you're going to want more tools in your toolbox to tackle these AI workloads. So I actually began my career as a chip designer at Intel. And from every generation, we knew that we were going to have about twice the performance available at our disposal just by the way they would manufacture the transistors. Smaller transistors meant, meant more of them on a chip, meant faster frequencies, and thus faster performance. But that march of Moore's law has basically plateaued. They've hit the physical limitations with the fabrication uh, processes they have, the materials they have at their disposal. We can't make these transistors any smaller than they already are. Meanwhile, while Moore's Law has plateaued, we've come to the AI boom. Around 2012 was when deep learning really started taking off, replacing some of the more traditional algorithms or traditional machine learning uh, ways of solving things. And in doing so, all of these deep neural networks required massive amount of compute, much more than traditional workloads. These things would be trained over and over on deep neural networks, many different nodes to compute, and potentially on thousands or millions of data points. All that iteration required a lot of horsepower. Around the midpoint of this timeline on this chart is about the time I joined NVIDIA. This is a Google Cloud partner, and they also are the designers of GPUs that run a lot of uh, AI workloads. NVIDIA noted that the parallel architecture of the GPUs, which were initially designed for gaming, served very well to the parallel nature of these deep learning workloads. So they began investing in the software stack to make sure you could take general code from a CPU and put it on a GPU. One thing to note about this chart, this is in log scale. This is not linear growth year over year. This is exponential growth year over year for the compute requirements for some of these networks. Going from start to finish, if we look at AlphaGo in the upper right to one of the first neural networks, AlexNet, the amount of compute required to execute uh, AlphaGo is over 300,000 times more in six years. So 
Obviously, the traditional methods won't suffice for these latest AI workloads. But there are also a range of other AI models with varying complexities and varying compute requirements that are going to be much more relevant to a business use case than AlphaGo simulating the board game of Go. And here's just a sample of a few of them. It's been said that AI is the new electricity, meaning it's going to impact every single business in some very fundamental ways. The boxes we've highlighted in these different industry verticals are some of the more prominent use cases for our AI infrastructure customers. These use cases, they tend to benefit from having that lower level control of the silicon or that higher level performance. Uh, for example, you saw, if you were in the keynote this morning with Andrew on AI, you saw how doctors can use this for medical imaging, diagnosing diseases, retail. This can help you manage your inventory, uh, and even in the financial sector, can help with high-priced uh, trading. So every one of these use cases, no matter which one, no matter what model you're running, is going to be executed on silicon, either a CPU, GPU, or our cloud TPU is a custom-built chip we'll talk a little bit more about. So to unlock these cases, we have our full cloud AI stack at your disposal. Whether you're a business decision maker who might be focused more on the higher level solutions like contact center AI, or a developer or technical practitioner, we give you lower level access, uh, be it with our AutoML building blocks, our AI platform, and of course, why we're all gathered here today is we're going to be focusing on the foundation upon uh, which all of this executes and how you can get access to a lot of this horsepower without the need for spending your own capex or waiting to build your own data center. All of this will be available to you on demand. Thanks, Adam. So how do you decide which AI infrastructure you should choose? Um, first and foremost, the most important thing that I want to talk about is it's about the range of options that you have and the supporting software stack that supports the AI infrastructure underneath the scenes. So let's go ahead and get started. So like I mentioned earlier, GCP offers a wide selection of accelerators for every workload and every scale. So you can start off with CPUs. CPUs are very effective for low cost, low throughput inference, as well as for traditional ML workloads. As you look at scaling up your workloads, you can look at GPUs. GPUs are, with their parallel architecture, they are super effective at machine learning workloads. So we have a variety of NVIDIA GPUs available on our GCE, Google Compute Engine, ranging from P4s and T4s, which are focused on inference. P4 was our first inference chip that we launched. We were first to, first, first to market to bring T4s on GCP. And then if you look at K80s, K80s are historically the ones that have been, they're, they're, they're the oldest uh, GPUs that we have deployed on GCP and among the most popular ones that are more focused on traditional large scale deep learning workloads. And then we have V100s and P100s, which are the latest generation. V100s are the latest generation NVIDIA GPUs with tensor cores built into them. Taking that to the next level, we have TPUs. So you, you all have heard about TPUs in the past, but if those that have not, let me give you a quick background into TPUs. Google has been investing in AI um, and has built these TPUs effectively as their own supercomputer. Back in 2015, Google came to a point where we basically come, came to terms with the fact that we could not actually use GPUs and CPUs by themselves just to meet our own AI demand, computational demands. And that's when the TPUs were born. And over the last couple of years, you know, we have had a variety of releases with TPUs. Um, the most notable one was last year, uh, earlier on this year at Next in San Francisco, um, when we launched the beta for TPU pods. Um, what do TPUs do really well? And why would you choose TPUs versus GPUs or CPUs? TPUs do one thing really well. They do matrix multiplication for deep learning workloads really, really well. And the other thing that TPUs do really, really well that I want you to take away with is they scale up very quickly, and they work where if you have models that you have trained on, if you have basically trained models and you want to use the same model that you have trained to serve and do inference, they let you serve what you have actually built. So let's talk a little bit about the portfolio of cloud GPU offerings on GCP. 
Like I mentioned earlier, V100s and P100, uh, P100s are our powerhouses that are focused on ML training workloads. K80 started ML training workloads years ago, and they are likely our most popular, uh, they are likely our most popular uh, GPUs because of the cost, that they help you basically scale up really, really high with min keeping your cost to a minimal. And then last but not the least, we have P4s and P4s for inference. Um, P4s, like I mentioned earlier, were first launched on GCP, we were first to market, and they have been used today by a variety of our customers, ranging from Snapchat that I'll talk about later, um, to Schlumberger and others. Let's move on and spend a little bit more time about on-cloud TPUs. So I mentioned earlier, uh, TPUs were built by Google, they're custom-built ASIC, and they're focused on really, really being able to iterate and do fast iterative development. Um, to address the performance gap the earliest, uh, uh, that we addressed earlier today, um, we built these TPUs with the primary perspective in mind that we want to make sure that customers are able to scale up their deep learning workloads without having to wait for those trained models to take hours and days. So what TPUs really do well is they help you bring down your training timelines from days and hours to minutes. I want to really make sure that you guys take this back. This, along with taking a number of other GPUs, can be attained. You can accomplish the same by wiring up a number of GPUs together. Um, in terms of ease of use, we have focused a lot on TensorFlow 1.15 and PyTorch support on TPUs. So today, we support both TensorFlow and PyTorch. We announced the PyTorch Alpha a couple of weeks ago at the PyTorch conference, and then also a few weeks ago at TensorFlow World, we talked about how TPUs have a first-class offering with TensorFlow 1.15. So now that you've heard about all our AI infrastructure offerings, how do you build, train, and deploy using this AI infrastructure? And I talked about earlier on how Google is working on making AI infrastructure and AI in general democratized. And what we have done with that is, let's talk about one example. The one example that I want to talk about really quickly today is looking at Kubeflow pipelines. Kubeflow pipelines are an open source product that Google has released uh, that is basically a no lock-in hybrid solution for letting you take your production workloads from on-prem to cloud for your bursty deep learning workloads, deep learning training workloads. It is the same code that you deploy on-prem that then you can take and deploy to cloud for your bursty workloads. And the, 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 the key thing that I want to make sure that you all take away from this is that it's the Qflow notebooks that you start with on-prem, and then it's the AI platform notebooks that you use in the cloud. And then there is this ML, hybrid ML SDK, which is offered through Qflow pipelines that lets you take those workloads seamlessly from on-prem to cloud. Another key important point to kind of highlight here is that in addition to just the Kubeflow pipelines, there are a number of other products that are offered in, as part of the Cloud AI platform and the Google Compute Engine that let you leverage and take advantage of this infrastructure on a daily basis. Moving on. Okay. And next, we'll give you some ways in which you can optimize for either performance or for cost, depending on what's your priority or what's necessary for the workload you're using. As Manish already covered, we have a wide range of NVIDIA GPUs in the cloud, and there's a few different ways you can use a GPU or our GPU instances to scale beyond a single GPU. With our customizable VM shapes, you can select up to eight GPUs, in the case of the high-end V100, uh, to your image so that you can get that extra processing power to get through your job quicker. In addition to that, we allow you to customize the amount of memory that's needed for that workflow, as well as the number of CPUs that might be needed there. And a benefit with this customization, you only have to pay for what you're using, uh, nothing more. Now say you need more scale than what's available with GPUs. That's where this beast comes into play. This is our AI supercomputer. This is a cloud TPU pod. If you're actually curious to see this in person, we have one of these racks on display in the center of the expo hall. Uh, don't be afraid to take a selfie with it. I've seen plenty of people do it already. This is our latest generation, and it has set performance records for both training 
end inference or deployments in the industry standard benchmark ML perf. And we'll give you a sense of what that scalability actually looks like, because you can take, depending on your need, if you don't need the full pod, you can break this problem down into smaller chunks, or what we call slices, half a pod, one eighth of a pod, whatever might be appropriate for your workload or your cost sensitivity. Because we're not just designing a single chip here, we're designing in a whole AI system one of the benefits of the cloud infrastructure and cloud TPU pods is it also incorporates this 2D toroidal mesh, which can, uh, guarantees that all the communication that's happening between these chips will happen very quickly, and thus your job will complete sooner. Now, what does scaling actually look like on a cloud TPU pod? We have data straight from this MLPerf benchmark I mentioned previously showing how depending on which slice size you're using, you get almost near linear scaling going from uh, the baseline performance of I think is only about 16 chips all the way up to a full cloud TPU pod of over 1,000 chips can give you over a 33x increase in performance. I actually used to live outside of London and I learned how popular motorsports are here. So to put this in a different way, the way previous comparisons have been made against comparing one chip to the next has been like performance per chip, performance per watts. And so think of this as a, an F1 race. You can look at how many meters per second that driver took around the corner, how much horsepower per cylinder you get in this one car, but the main business value, the main thing you're looking at, who wins? Which crosses the finish line sooner, and this is very important when you're all a lot of this hardware can be abstracted away in the cloud. An example of one customer who's used that performance to great effect is recur Recursion Pharmaceuticals. They've been using AI to accelerate the way they discover new cures for drugs. Their example, they went from 24 hours to train a model on their local on-prem cluster to 15 minutes when they move to a cloud TPU pod. Said another way, you could iterate more on this model during your lunch break than you could your entire work week if you were doing it on-prem. This level of performance opens up new opportunities for customers who might have been gated by limitations of their on-prem cluster or by cost limitations for expanding that cluster. Now on the flip side, say you don't need answers right away, but you would prefer to maximize the amount of compute you have, uh, and this is where we offer preemptible GPUs or preemptible instances. This is ideal for batch workloads uh, where you don't need the answer right away because this is using our excess capacity, and we give it to you at a massive discount up to 70% off of our on-demand GPU instances, for example. This is really great for customers who have that finite budget. Uh, in this case, we have a quote from a researcher from Stanford University. They have a set amount of money. They prefer to maximize the amount of compute they can get for it, the maximum amount of research they can get for it. Basically, this allows you to do more with less. All right, now that you've heard from Adam, on the scale and performance that is offered through our GPUs and TPUs at the AI infrastructure. Let me tell you a little bit about how do you get started and stick scale really quickly using AI infrastructure. So to start off with, we, like I mentioned earlier, we have a variety of tools that are available to you. This is just a small segmentation. What I'm going to cover is just give you a preview of two or three areas where you can start consuming and leveraging our AI infrastructure easily. Let's start off with AI platform. Um, AI platform lets you take projects from ideation to production quickly and cost effectively. And one such example is the Kubeflow pipelines that I talked about earlier. Kubeflow pipelines let you go from on-prem to cloud. They let you very easily scale up your workloads and really get started on building end-to-end -end production pipelines that you may want to test on-prem and then productionalize on, on the cloud because that's where all your data lives. Another area to kind of look at 
consuming and leveraging AI infrastructure very easily by is, is using Kubernetes engine, is using GKE or Google Kubernetes engine. What Kubernetes engine gives you is it gives you a managed environment for deploying your containerized applications. And in this case, you can use GPUs and TPUs as part of GCE as an infrastructure to instantly scale up and scale down your workloads. Uh, what GKE also gives you is it gives you the ability to use containers um, to take advantage of auto-scaling. And so when you're looking at your GPU utilization and you want to use scaling to scale up and scale down your workload costs, this gives you an instant ability to basically spin up an on-demand GPU cluster and spin that down as and when your requirements are changing. Last but not the least, I'll quickly talk about GCE, which is the compute engine. Um, GCE Compute Engine helps offer custom VM shapes with tooling and workflow support to, again, go from a GPU under your desk to supercomputing scale that is available through on-demand, preemptible, as well as committed use discounts and sustained use discounts-based reservations, which is effectively you buying a chunk of a colo in our data centers. What is included? Um, as part of the broader AI platform tooling and solutions that I mentioned today, we have a number of tools that are available. Um, the one that I want to actually emphasize and make sure that you all take away from today is our most popular service on AI platform, which is the Deep Learning VM. Deep Learning VM, like I mentioned, is the most popular product that we have today on Cloud AI. It makes it very easy for you to deploy your ML workloads to the cloud. It lets you get started as a developer if you're curious about getting started with ML infrastructure or AI infrastructure or AI needs, this gives you a way for you to get started without having to worry about installing all the different packages that are needed to get you going. We make this super easy with a one-click install. Adam will show you later today how this is put into place with a quick demo that we'll walk you through. Um, the one thing I want to make sure that I really touch upon here is what deep learning images do is they make it very easy for you to with one click button to be able to choose whether you want to deploy your model or you want to run this model on a CPU, GPU, or a TPU, and gives you access to all our various AI infrastructure options. And you could basically go and leverage your existing projects that you have already created using GCE and leverage them with the deep learning VM seamlessly. And last but not the least, I will talk a little bit about TensorFlow Enterprise. TensorFlow Enterprise was announced at TF World a couple of weeks ago by my colleague, Craig Wiley. Um, the team has spent a lot of time talking to enterprise customers, and it became very clear that TensorFlow as an open source offering versus TensorFlow as an enterprise offering needed to be there primarily to address the concerns that our customers have in terms of support, in terms of security patches, so on and so forth. So, what, so starting with TensorFlow 1.15, um, GCP is going to offer security patches for select bug fixes for up to three years. Um, this is basically currently in beta, and it's a free offering. Um, what you need to do behind the scenes is leverage TensorFlow Enterprise to connect to AI infrastructure offerings, whether it's GPUs or TPUs or CPUs, and leverage this capability for your AI needs. I'll talk a little bit about Snapchat, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Snapchat has used a combination of a lot of our AI infrastructure. The one that I would want to quickly give a highlight on is they do use um, our T4s around the globe for serving their recommendations uh, for, their, for, for Snapchat's social, social media customers. And today, they use T4s across our eight regions that are available in GCP, giving their customers easy access to low, infra low latency inference across the globe. OK, so now we're going to show you in under two minutes, you can time me if you like, how you can select a GPU, get this spun up in a notebook, and already get executing on a model. In this use case, we're actually going to be pulling the image, which is essentially run from our deep learning VMs that Manish just mentioned. And one more point on the, the deep learning VMs, I've had developers come and complain about, hey, I wanted the latest version of TensorFlow, but it broke my entire, uh, my entire stack. This is all solved with deep learning VMs. When you have CUDA, Nickel, TensorRT, uh, this version of TensorFlow, this version of the software driver, 
these do not always uh, play nice together, are not performance optimized, are not compatible with deep learning VMs and the images we're about to pull. It just works. So uh, let's cut to the video here. And so we're going to show you first how you can select. Uh, we've already s going to select the TensorFlow Enterprise image. And there's three different ways to actually select a GPU. You can actually customize it and see the full list of GPUs we have offered here. Or if we back out to the main interface, you see that GPU drop down there where you can also select multiple GPUs. For now, we're just going to get started with one, and we're going to go with the K80. While this instance gets ready, we'll select it and then click Start. And all we have to do is click Open Jupyter Lab, and we will have all of the code at our disposal for this demo and the GPU running behind the scenes. So we get started here. We're importing TensorFlow. We're importing the libraries, confirming that the system sees we have a GPU as well as that Keras, the higher level uh, layer of TensorFlow we're using here, sees the GPU. Now we're importing the data. And before we actually go into training the model, we're going to show you through the command line how you can get more uh, insights into what's happening behind the scenes with your specific GPU for this instance. This will give you some details as to what version of CUDA you might be running, uh, even the temperature of the GPU, and more importantly, stuff like the percentage utilization for the given bit of hardware. So now we're already training the model. And you can see here, we have 30% utilization for this GPU. We can even see the amount of GPU memory usage uh, that's available. All right, let's cut back to the slides. So that was with one GPU. But as we mentioned previously, you can select up to eight GPUs with some of these instances. In addition to selecting eight in that UI we just saw, there's one other change you should make, and that's picking a distribution strategy for your code. In this case, we're selecting a mere strategy, and you would set that as the scope for building your model code. Everything else is taken care of for you. While we talked about a few different customers using our TPUs or GPUs. Here's just a sample of some of our EMEA and UK-based customers that are already using Cloud AI to solve some of their problems. If you'd like to see Spotify, they're actually going to be speaking across the hall at 12.45 today to talk more about their data analytics and AI use cases. So to wrap up what we've talked about, GCP offers a wide range of accelerators, one of the widest available, and thus this gives you the benefits of having more tools in your toolbox to tackle the high performance problems or low cost inference. This also is given to you in a way that you can access this the way you choose. The lower level uh, access to the hardware, the AI platform, or higher level building blocks within the Google Cloud AI stack, it is all executing on our CPUs, our GPUs, and our TPUs. If you would like to try this out for yourself, there's a few ways to get started. First is just checking out some of the product pages at g.co slash cloud uh, slash GPU slash NVIDIA or TPU for those respective products. And there's plenty of getting started docs and how-to guides we'd recommend that really can walk you through this process, including the demo we just walked through on our uh, documents and our uh, product pages as well. So with that, uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, and we'll open the rest of the time up for Q&A. And if you have any questions we can't get to, we also have this alias here to address some of your infrastructure needs. Thank you.